This is the Evergreen Empire. Green grow the forests and fair flow the streams. The gentle deer grazes, the wild blossom gleams. From ocean wave raging to mountain serene. All nature's proclaiming our land's evergreen. Welcome to Columbia Conversations. I'm Felix Bunnell, editor of Columbia Magazine for the Washington State Historical Society. On this episode, we speak with author Jack Nisbet about his new book, The Dreamer and the Doctor, from Sasquatch Books, and about his previous works with their distinctive explorations of 19th century Pacific Northwest history. Very often I can go to someplace David Douglas went and look at his collections that he made during that week and see exactly the same plants. And it might be inside the city limits of Spokane, and I can still see exactly the same plants. And I, I take that as encouragement that we are not going to destroy ourselves, that somehow we're going to survive, and uh, that the, or the plants are anyway. Jack Nisbet is the author of award-winning books about David Thompson and David Douglas, and he was recently honored by the Washington State Historical Society with the Robert Gray Medal. We spoke just after the award ceremony at the Washington State History Museum in Tacoma. You've just received the Robert Gray Medal? Yes. Is it, how does it feel to receive a, it's almost like a lifetime achievement award. I think that's yeah. how they play it. My immediate thought is um, I don't want to quit. <laughs> and I think it's, it's almost like a retirement invitation, but I'm not taking it as that. Yeah, I, no, I I'm a fan of Robert Gray <laughs> and I'm a fan of a lot of the, that period, that contact period is what I write about a lot. So it couldn't, I could not be happier. And it seems like that contact period, like there's so much great material there that even with the work that you've done, there's still so much that remains to be plowed. I mean, what are there, are there people or stories you've run across that are still on your list of things to do that you'd be willing to share with us now? Or is there sort of a secret list of, of stories that you're, you have yet to get to that you, you can't share with us? Oh, that's an interesting question. I, I work in the interior. Uh -huh. the, there's very little material. I mean, you, there's a finite amount of material from the interior because it was so isolated. And uh, it's built on the way the Columbia flows, which is very all over the place and up and down and not logical. So um, I guess I'm interested in continuing what I'm doing, which is following original journals, most of which my wife and I have, and connecting them to oral accounts by tribal people, all of whom still live there, and just working my way back and back and back. And I'm moving forward in time a little bit, but very slowly. And how do you reconcile that difference, which has bugged me for a long time? I've been studying history, Northwest history, for about, I guess about 15 years, seriously, I would say, which doesn't seem like very long to me. But that the almost uh, de facto domination that a written culture has over the narrative compared to an oral culture, and especially an oral culture that isn't necessarily readily shared with anybody who wants to hear it, that takes, I don't know, it take, takes a certain skill to be able to tease out the stories that, that, are, are, that are only oral based. How, how, do you, how do you juggle those two different worlds? Ever since I was a kid, I was into natural history. So I had a grandmother and a mom who taught me insects and birds and that kind of thing. And when I moved to eastern Washington, the northeast corner of the state in the 1970s, um, I saw a lot of familiar birds. I saw some familiar geology. Um, I, where I grew up in the Carolinas, there was gold mining and precious mineral mining. So a lot of what I was seeing was familiar. The history, the written history, was half of what I was used to from the south. So it was, to me, it was an opportunity to reconcile what you're saying because I could talk to, it took me a while to figure it out, it took me just a few years to figure it out, but there was tribal people who spoke about the way the Colville Valley was before the river was dredged in 1910 as if it was yesterday and understood what a mistake it was and how it changed their world. And they were eloquent at explaining both the before and the after. And then I could find journal entries from fur trade visitors who saw it in a completely different light, but had little clues to what the flora and fauna and geography of the place were like and how it had changed. So I guess off of that, my wife and I have put together all the early artwork and all the early written accounts. And um, I've made a point of getting to know all the tribes up and down the Columbia because David Thompson, who was the first real long work I did, he was the first guy to survey the whole river. So in order to write a book about him, 
Actually, I wrote two books about him. I wrote a book <laughs> about him, and I, I went out with a tribal person who told me everything I missed on the first book. And he, he, described, he sort of said the sentence that you just said and said, you're, you know, you're not doing it like it should be done. You, but you can't quit now. You've got all this base. You better get better at what you are doing. And I mean, a couple questions on that. How do you, what first inspired you to make the leap from being interested in natural history and insects and you know, flora and fauna to the human stories of the people, the early contact here? Because I've never seen any difference in human and natural history. They're the same thing to me. That's caused me no end of trouble, say, at school <laughs> or trying to pitch a book to a publisher. But they are the same thing to me. And my grandmother dealt with it that way and just said when I was struggling, well, why don't you just like major in natural history at college? And at the time, you couldn't. Now, I would say that I've lived long enough that it might be working better. If I had a grandkid today, I would say go major in natural history in college. And there's some schools that think about it, about it like that. You know, I can get excited trying to chase that because that's what I've been doing. And I don't see any reason to stop now. I have a lot of uh, people now saying, just keep doing what you're doing, please, because it, it is connected in a very deep way that is not really understood yet. As you say, there's still a long way to go. There's still a lot of original source work to uh, include in this larger story. Yeah, and then, you know, with history, there's always the academic history that's going on w within universities and journals and things that the general public doesn't always see a lot of. Then there's also sort of the popular history, you know, the Stephen Ambrose, the you know, the sort of this history is a bestseller sort of thing. And somewhere in the middle of all that is like Pacific Northwest history. And you've probably witnessed a lot of evolution or maturation of how that sort of, I guess it's what you call it, popular history or history for, for a general audience. What they, what they call it now is public history, yeah. is what, what some universities have courses or degrees even in public history. And I've had yeah. people tell me that's what I'm doing. Yeah. I don't know that's what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm, again, and I, I, I think this is true of any writer is um, I don't see the process that I go through as that much different than a fiction writer. I mean, I'm trying to tell a story and I'm picking elements that I want to pick to put in there. I, my, I have to take it out of this window of an original manuscript and I have to vet that manuscript or I hear a story from some elder and I have to weigh what I think is the veracity of the story. But once I have those things, I get to shape it like I want to because that's how writers work. So to say that it is public, meaning to me that it includes everybody and everything that's out there, that's in these manuscripts, that's in the geography of the place, I'm fine with it. I mean, I have a very simple method. I get, a, I get somebody that is interesting to me that might be some woman homesteader keeping a diary or it might be a tribal elder describing the round, the annual round where they go and how they adjust from season to season or I find a fur trade journal. I try to go to the same place that they went to the same week of the year. And now that climate change is happening, I get to see whether it's different or not. But very often, very often I can go to some place David Douglas went and look at his collections that he made during that week and see exactly the same plants. And it might be inside the city limits of Spokane and I can still see exactly the same plants. And I, I take that as encouragement that we are not going to destroy ourselves, that somehow we're going to survive, and uh, that the, or the plants are anyway, and that they're going to keep on. I, I can live with that. And in the time that you've been doing this work, um, has there been a maturation or, or a willingness for acceptance of more sophisticated approaches to narratives like what you're doing? Because, I mean, could you have done this 50 years ago, or did the culture have to catch up to, to be able to understand what you're doing and appreciate what you're doing and find it or good stories, always good stories. I, I was going to say, that's an interesting yeah. question. Yeah, I think good stories are always good. I mean, Stephen Ambrose, his book sold millions of copies, <laughs> right? Yeah. And part of it was he was working from, he, you know, he was known in the East, and he, people are always, the Eastern people always romanticize the West, and Thomas Jefferson <laughs> said Lewis and Clark Bicentennial up as like he visualized. All that's true, yeah. but he's the one, and, and he didn't do any of the scholarly work that was, a whole different project to get these journals out, and he just cherry picked them. But if he, but he was really good at telling a story, yeah. then that Lewis and Clark narrative, according to Ambrose, enters everybody's mind. I'm not on that level in that. I mean, I think the guys that I'm studying are on the level of Lewis and Clark, but I, 
It's hard to write a book about the Northwest that sells millions of copies. I can sell thousands of copies. <laughs> and, and again, I, I have this small little group of people that appreciate what I'm doing, and I can go to any little town that David Thompson or David Douglas went to in Alberta or BC or Idaho or Montana or Washington or Oregon, and people will show up because they're interested in Douglas and Thompson. So I'll take that. Again, I'm not, uh, I have to have another job to make a living, but I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm okay with that because I'd like to take people out and learn from them anyway and teach and go visit different schools. That's the work feeds itself in other words. And I think that would have worked in 1900 or 1850 just as well as it works now. But it does seem to be, the timing seems to be good now. I would agree with you on that. Yeah. And so tell me about the new book that's just out now or is coming out or is already? I, I have a book coming out next month. It's called The Dreamer and the Doctor. It's about, and it's, again, it's just doing the same thing that I do. David Thompson was a fur trader who surveyed the whole Columbia and made amazing maps of the water course of the whole Columbia and the eastern, major eastern tributaries. David Douglas was a botanist who came 15 years later in 1820, 20s and 30s, and he went on these trails that were established by Thompson from tribal trails as fur trade routes. The people who worked for Thompson were his guides. Many of them had married tribal women, so I'm sort of deep into the world now. He got off the main trails to go look for plants, often with 12-year-old kids guiding him and going back to their mother's place. And I'm going, man, this is great, but uh, how do I get a uh, woman or a couple deep into their story, and how do I get further off the trail? And there's a couple named John and Carrie Lieberg who came here in the 1880s, homesteaded on Lake Ponderay. He came out with the railroad originally, um, and was a prospector like everybody of that time. He was filing claims to get rich, but he loved plants. And he got a job doing a plant survey in Washington in 1893 that went from Spokane to Mount Stewart at Stevens Pass, just as the econo economy was crashing in the US. And then he got more of those. And then he started working for the USGS and surveying forest reserves that became the forest national forest lands that we know today, at a time when there was great outcry over government lands and their management. I mean, it's just so much like now. So, and he writes very perceptively about fire and um, public responsibility and plants and habitats and grazing and cat all the kinds of issues we have. He's very good on that. Meanwhile, his wife was a physician. She was the only lady surgeon for the Northern Pacific Railroad. She wrote, she published journal articles about botched abortions and pregnancies gone wrong and just harrowing stuff and what public health was like at that time. So together, they do a lot of the things that I want and have story built into them, but, but I get to go anywhere. I mean, he, this guy, John Lieberg, went everywhere that I want to go. Uh, he, he surveyed 13 different forest reserves, which became like 25 different national forests. Wow. So it's an excuse to go outside and walk, which is all I started <laughs> out doing anyway, really. How did you come across those, these two? Um, so it takes a lot to make a book out of them. A lot of things have to fall right to make a book. So people had been encouraging me to look at him, but they were very different people. There's he, the woman doctor is a cult figure to a bunch of women, especially women physicians. Um, there's a fire ecologist that tried to get me to write about fire and John Lieberg's writings about fire 20 years ago. There's a silviculturalist who tried to show me what he was talking about in tree species. There's a botanist that was saw, had the original, uh, had, a, had a bad original copy of the plant survey that he did and then I was able to go back to DC and look at the plants that he collected and look at a better copy of his journal. So. And I, I, I work with my wife, and she still didn't, th didn't think that it would work because he's not, she didn't think he was funny enough. Because <laughs> stories have to be funny. I mean, there has to be humor involved or it doesn't work. And, and the people that I've written about all had senses of humor. And everybody likes to think they're funny, so I've got to think <laughs> I'm funny too. So I think this guy's funny. Um, and certainly he says funny things, and he, and he uh, gets into these situations that, um, his enthusiasm and his energy 
just sort of carry him above all this. And, and the same with Carrie. They do things that you can only, we make us smile now. They might not have been smiling then, but when Carrie like has a parrot and her hobby is making furniture while she's a doctor, while she's raising a troubled kid, you know, you just, it sounds just too great. You know, stories make you sort of perk up and, and part of that is smiling. So I determined that it was enough. And then we spent the next three years chasing down more of these original manuscripts and documents. And it turns out in his personal letters, he is funny. That's great. Sounds like a screenplay to me. Is there, have you has been optioned yet for a screenplay? <laughs> <laughs> so I've worked on four David Thompson documentaries and they were all very unsatisfying experiences. <laughs> if you, so no, the answer is no. And, and that's all, but that's also an interesting question. I teach a lot in public schools or I visit a lot of public schools and take them outside and mm -hmm. try to gauge what kids are doing. And there's certainly a lot of kids that don't read. That's why I got into museum exhibits. Yeah. And um, films are, are, can, could work, but you would have to, uh, I, having just said that I get to shape the story, <laughs> if you made a film, you'd have to really shape it. Because yeah. there's some nasty stuff in this that is not a clean storyline. Netflix, yeah. maybe Netflix series, <laughs> right? And they have they have nasty <laughs> stuff, right? So, but it's a, to me, it's a an example of how messy human lives are. They don't follow the kind of arc that you think of that you associate with a film or a story. And it's easier yeah. when I have 300 or 400 pages to work with. I can get a, I can weave my way around it and come back to make some kind of logical sense. Mm -hmm. And I. I have never been able, I've never seen a one hour movie that did that, a one hour television documentary that was able to do it satisfactorily. It is pretty unsatisfying how it's much tough. they have to leave out if, you really, if you're really thorough and you care about the minor details yes. that, that yes. and they're minor details only in size, but they add to the weight and the arc and everything. It's really hard to edit stuff out. I totally, I completely Very much so. That's that. what, that's what writing is about yeah. is details and yeah. Um, my wife and I do a lot of interpretive signs, and I have to let her write the text. You know, 50 <laughs> words. We'll give you 50 words on this sign. I struggle with that. Now, you um, talked about the, um, Mr. Lieberg doing surveys up to Stevens Pass. Did, did any of the work that the, uh, this is a slightly tangential question, any of the work that Isaac Stevens did, not the, I know Stevens Pass is not named for Isaac Stevens, but all that railroad survey work that they did in the 1850s that included a lot of botanical stuff, was that worth anything to anybody 50 years later? Okay. Well, he's 40 years later. 40 years later, okay. And he's, he's really into it. One of his big heroes is Newberry, that Newberry Craters in Eastern Oregon are uh, named for. And he ran a tangential survey from the Pacific route down into California. Oh, he did, okay. He's a huge hero of Lieberg's. Okay. The reason he's a hero is that he, was, he got praised when he filed his railroad report, which is in the Stevens Report, yeah. the 12-volume Stevens Report. Yeah, yeah for doing more than, he was a geologist, doing more than just a geologic uh, explanation of the countryside. It was more geographic. In other words, and it's, it's what we're talking about. In other words, he included all the elements of the landscape, including the people. And that's what Lieberg wanted, aspired to do. So when he went across, um, he's real interested in alpine plants. He follows the railroad grade. That's what he can drive his wagon on a lot. And so uh, it's a way for him to get up. He describes this torturous turn at Stevens Pass that the trains had to make at the time. That's now a little side a vista point. Yeah. He climbs Mount Stewart because he can't get up on any of the peaks in the crest of the Cascades there because they're too, they require technical climbing. So he goes back down to Icicle Creek, tries to climb Mount Stewart. It doesn't work. He gets local knowledge to say, oh, you just go up the backside and it's a walk up. <laughs> That's the kind of thing that I like. So yeah. in your climbing book, uh, any kind of Cascades climbing book, usually um, it's a guy named Sam Gannett who worked for the USGS gets credit for climbing Mount Stewart and leaving a cairn up there. And he was a government surveyor working for the USGS in 1895. But John Lieber clearly climbed it in 1893 looking for plants and describes in his journal. He just didn't care about scale, you know, first peaks. That's not what he's about. He's about plants. And, and I'm real interested in that aspect of what people want, what they aspire to do, where they think they're headed. And Lieberg comes off, he, he reads well, you know, to a modern sense because he's really thinking about things that we think about now. And that's always, you always want to pick somebody that, you know, is not mean to women and that, that, that's, that 
they don't they aren't modern they're people of their time they have all the faults of people of their time but they it's like they can visualize that there's going to be a world where you have to respect the entire landscape and look on it as a whole and that includes the people which would be crazily radical in 1890 it's not what they were doing it's yeah, not what yeah. most of the folks were doing in 1890 now, hearing you talk about this stuff, and I think about this a little bit myself as well, you know, that, that interconnectedness of the different, number one, just the sheer small number of um, non-natives who were here in the 19th century. It's, it's easy for things to kind of overlap. But pretty soon, you st all these stories, I imagine for you, everything must just kind of all tie together and must to a part where it almost makes your head spin because you can't like sort of, it, it all just, so, it's so interconnected, I guess is what I'm trying to say. When I start, when David Thompson comes, he has a handful of, Voyageurs working with them who are all mixed blood, and uh, he brings tribal people that are plains or eastern woodlands culture. He's the one that starts it all, and then he leaves. And then, because I go around to schools, I am able to track family by family. Where I'll go to the Spokane Res, and there'll be uh, descendants of people who work for Thompson, and then I'll go to the Colville Res, and there'll be another family, and then I'll go to the Cowsbill Res, and there'll be the same family. Again, you know, there's all this inner tribal and inter-white and intermixed blood, it's all Métis at some point. And that's what I can track through the oral histories. And to me, that makes it make sense. I do have to cut it off at about the 1870s and 80s usually because it does get complicated then. Yeah. But for about a half a century, the interior, eastern Washington was, it, was, it remained in, as David Thompson's just business that he started and left to run for itself, where it was the Hudson's Bay Company and not, and whoever came in had to pay their respects to them. Wow. And that makes it so my brain can handle it. My brain explodes around the time they do the boundary of 1846, or certainly by the yeah. time, you know, by the time Stevens comes and does his railroad surveys. That's, that, traditionally, that's when I stop. But John Lieberg uh, got me refocused again, because, again, he sees a plant. He goes, oh, David Douglas saw this plant, but he saw it at high elevation. And I'm seeing it down here near the river. What is going on? What has changed? So he writes an article about climate change in National Geographic magazine, which is a new magazine, in 1899. Wow. And he says the West is drying up, getting warmer, things are changing. And so he recognizes the dynamic life, not only of, of a whole forest, of a whole landscape, of a whole region. He recognizes that it's, things are changing and constantly in motion in the natural world, and in, as, as, just as they are in the human world. Very exciting to talk to you about your career and about this forthcoming book. And thanks for joining us today on Columbia Conversations. Jack Nisbet. Thank you very much, Felix. Thank you to Jack Nisbet for speaking with me for this episode of Columbia Conversations from the Washington State Historical Society. His newest work, The Dreamer and the Doctor, is published by Sasquatch Books. For more information about Columbia Magazine or to subscribe, please visit WashingtonHistory.org. I'm Felix Bunnell.